Good morning, everyone. This is Don. I hope this is part of your wonderful daily routine now. Um, it is 9 o'clock on Monday morning, March 23rd. I'm um, just adding this right here for prosperity, I guess, or dexterity or propensity. I don't really care. Don't really know. Um, but good morning. Hope everybody's doing well today. Um, we're going to go over our airbag circuits and pretensioners um, because I think this is going to help those of you who need more than just reading and yeah, maybe a video here and there, but this is a video, so it's very meta, but that's okay. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to share my screen here. All right, we're talking about chapter 60 in the new textbook. In the old textbook, I think it's like chapter 49 or something. So here, but basically go in your index if you don't know what it is and go to airbag and pretensioner circuits. And in the new book, it's on page 715. Or if you want to follow along in the PowerPoints, that's okay as well. Our objective of this course. As of course, explain how safety belts and retractors function, explain the operation of front airbags, describe the operation, or describe the, yeah, the operation of front airbags, describe the procedures to diagnose or repair common faults in the airbag systems, and explain how the passenger presence systems works. So, airbags and pretensioners, they kind of need seat belts. The seat belts are the most important part of your whole safety devices in your vehicle. Um, most safety belts, especially in the front, involves like a three-point uh, support and are constructed from a nylon webbing, which is about two inches wide. That nylon's pretty tough. Um, um, and you, you'll generally have a buckle side or a retractor side. But the belt retractor here, emergency locking retractors, will lock the position of the safety belt in the event of a collision or a rollover. That's to kind of help keep you in your seat. Um, Um, emergency and web speed sensitive retractors, which allow freedom of movement to the driver and passenger, but also lock the, if the vehicle is accelerating too fast or if it's, um, decelerating too fast. So if you're accelerating really fast, sometimes your seatbelt will lock and sometimes if you hit the slam on the brakes really hard, your seatbelt will lock up. Um, those are a little bit better. I had a Mustang one time. Well, I've had many Mustangs, but a lot of times if you lean forward and lean back, it would just start like catching and it wouldn't like let you out until you let the seatbelt go all the way back in the retractor and then come all the way back out. And that's kind of a pain, but it's just the way it's designed um, to just lock the seatbelt in the event of a collision or a rollover. Um, but you also got to remember back from driver's ed, if you're driving yet, you've had driver's ed, talk about three different, um, yeah, the crash has three different collisions. Uh, crash number one, uh, collision number one happens when the vehicle strikes another vehicle or object. So say you're going 30 miles an hour and you hit a tree. Terrible, terrible thing. I don't recommend doing it. Um, I don't even recommend doing it at 10 miles an hour. It's best up your bumper pretty bad. Um, but the vehicle strikes into another object. That's collision number one. The second collision that occurs out of the three is the driver and or passenger will hit objects inside the vehicle if we're unbelted. So, you know, before seat belts were mandatory and required, when you got into an accident or something, you're, you would hit this, the steering wheel and collapse your lungs and cause all kind of problems like that or hit the dash. Um, I'm a little older, so all of our dashes that I grew up with were metal, and there was no padding on it. It was just steel right there in front of you, nice and shiny and either black or red in the vehicles we had. Um, but that was collision number two. Collision number three happens when internal organs inside your body actually start hitting other organs or bones, which causes internal injuries, which is why a lot of people who... Um, uh, just uh, die in car wrecks, actually die from internal injuries a lot of times. Um, that third collision there. But if a safety belt's being worn, um, the belt will stretch and absorbs part of the impact, thereby preventing collision with any other objects in the vehicle and reducing internal injuries. Um, so just be aware of that. You know, there's the three, three collisions that happen inside of a vehicle whenever that happens. All right, the retractors, 
or basically the part that comes back, brings her back into the, the, the seat there. Um, another part of the, the seat belts and retractors is, is the um, safety belt light and chimes. Um, now we have vehicles that you know light up and have a lights and all chimes right on the road over so many miles an hour. It'll start ding, 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 and that's to let you know, put your seatbelt on, put your seatbelt on, put your seatbelt on. Um, so just be aware of that. So there'll be a warning light on the dash or a chime will happen if the seatbelt is not fastened. Um, that can be true for the drivers, passengers, and any passengers in the rear seats of the vehicle. Um, the driver's seatbelt. The chime will, the light will come on, it'll start, it'll, it'll chime continuously just about right down the road because, yeah, it's kind of the law and it's also for your safety. Because if airbags are deploying, you're not wearing a seatbelt, airbags can kill you pretty quickly, pretty quickly. Um, a pretensioner, because you can't talk about seatbelts without talking about pretensioners, is a pretensioner is an explosive <laughs> or a pyrotechnic device that is part of a seatbelt retractor system and tightens the seatbelt if the airbag is deployed. Um, so what happens is, the reason we have this right here is the seatbelt assembly. Um, if you're in a collision right here, a lot of times you might be away from your seat because, oh no, this just happened, and it'll pull you back in your seat. They can retract um, two to six inches. It depends on the manufacturer. And that can be either on the retractor side or on the buckle side. And what that does, it helps pull you away from the airbag and away from the steering wheel or the dash or whatever else you're against or the seat behind you or the seat in front of you, I guess, would be more like it. It'll pull you back because it's a pretension. It's a pretension that and to pull you away from the airbag before it deploys. So be aware of that pretensioners. And most vehicles have them since like the 90s. Um, so just be aware of that. <clears throat> so for this reason, because it is an explosive, literally an explosive charge that happens, um, you want to make sure you don't use any kind of a power test light or any kind of voltage. So if you're using a um, power probe, make sure you don't ever add power to any kind of airbag wires because the smallest amount of voltage there will cause the airbags to deploy. And bad things happen when that happens. So be aware of that. <clears throat> That's pretensioners. Uh, but safety belts, other primary restraint systems, these are um, active restraint systems. You literally have to grab your seatbelt and put it around you. Uh, and remember, we were talking about the automatic seatbelts that went up around the driver's and passenger's doors. It was the, the shoulder harness part. Um, but then you still had to actively put your lap belt on. Um, thank God those went away. Um, and now you still have to actively put it on your seatbelt when you get in a vehicle for now. Um, but they are the primary part of a, a, a restraint system there. And during the collision, the stretching of the safety belt slows the impact to help reduce bodily injury. Now, if you ever decide to go into collision repair, um, just know this right here, that if a vehicle has been involved in collision, a lot of times you must replace that seat belt or the seat belt retractor. The pretensioner has to be replaced because that explosive device is only able to use once. It's a one-shot wonder, and after it's been deployed, it's done. Um, if you change the airbags in the vehicle and you think you've got everything done, run the codes again, the airbag light's still on, it'll say, Passenger side or drivers had pretensioner um, open or shorted. Uh, that generally means your retractor side has just been deployed and nobody did it. Um, back in the early 2000s, that was really a really popular thing we got at the shop. I mean, even at RCC, we got several people from Clear Repair saying, uh, "We put airbags in this vehicle and it's not really the, the light's still on it. Can you tell me why?" And all it was was the pretensioner was just deployed in it. So now most automotive collision repair shops know that they have to actually replace the pretensioner. You know, it's just, just standard fare, which is why a lot of times you get into a bump up and the airbags deploy. <laughs> and a lot of vehicles will total the vehicle out because you're busting the dash, you're busting the airbags, you also got pre to, to to replace. And on sometimes, if it has um, airbags in the seat, which I know we haven't talked about that yet, it's going to blow the seat, the part of the seat out. So you're talking about several thousands of dollars when it, you get an airbag deployment on there. So just be aware of that. Um, Talk about pretensioners or tensioners. Uh, most safety belts have an inertia type mechanism that locks the belt in the event of rapid movement. Accelerate really hard. That little weight at the bottom there will swing on its pivot there and actually lock the seat belt up. Uh, brake really hard. The same thing will happen there. So just be aware of that. And here's your typical safety uh, warning light. That's pretty typical there for all of them. Um, yeah, they're mostly red. 
I know my wife's car. She's got one that's on the, the, the entry panel cluster for the passenger seat. There's one in the center console because if I have like a gallon of milk or two, um, some weight on the passenger seat and nobody's riding with me, it'll ding like five times, like every, for the first minute, like every 30 seconds, it'll ding five times. And then it'll stop and ding probably every two to five minutes later. Just know that some, that something's in that passenger seat and it's not buckled in. Now, people in the back in the back seat of the vehicle there, if they're buckled in, that's great. Uh, but if they take their seatbelt off, we'll know about it um, because of pack, passenger occupancy detection. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, just lets the driver and lets the computers know that there's people in these seats. So it knows which airbags deploy, how to deploy them, and why they're depl being deployed. <clears throat> Small explosive charges in the pretensioner force the end of the seatbelt down a tube, which removes any slack in the seatbelt. Um, let me see if I can tell this right here. Yes, I can. Ooh, I can point to. Max select. I want to point. Ha ha. Here's my pointer. You can see this cable right there at the end of that seatbelt. Right here is your buckle side. That's your buckle side right there, and there's all the wiring on top of there. Um, this hole here is actually the bolt that actually bolts that to the body of the vehicle. And you can see this cable is attached to the uh, buckle itself. And it goes around this pivot here, which goes to this explosive charge. All right, when this charge is deployed, and there's a little, uh, basically what looks like a slug right here. And when this explosive charge happens, it pushes that slug out and blows it basically down this tube. Um, it'll actually stop before it gets to the end or right at the end of the tube. The tube is rolled over the end there, and it's open. Um, so if you look at the end of the tube, you'll be able to see that um, that seatbelt's been deployed. Um, it is what it is. Um, but that's a pretensioner right there. There's your wires. And notice a lot of people say, well, airbags always have yellow wires. They don't have yellow wires. Look at that pretensioner. That is an explosive device. If you powered that wire right there up, you'd blow that, that charge there. And like I said, it doesn't take much. Leads us to our first question of this chapter. What's what is the purpose of a pretensioner? Yes, I'm waiting for your answer. What you don't have a microphone? Okay, that's fine. Purpose of a pretensioner is to position the occupant properly for airbag deployment. Want us to get us away from that steering wheel. Wants to make make sure everything else happens. Makes everything great there. So, to position the uh, occupant properly for the deployment of the airbag. So, front airbags. <laughs> Purpose and function. And I'm sorry if my it gets loud. I can't hear how loud I am. I can just see my little meter right over here. So front airbags. The purpose and function of front airbags. An airbag is a passive restraint that is designed to cushion the driver, passenger, or the passenger if the passenger side is so equipped during a frontal collision. Uh, back in the day, we only had driver side airbags. Um, they decided to add passenger side airbags. On most trucks and SUVs, you can turn off the passenger side airbag. Um, and that's because some trucks do not have a rear seat. If you have any children in the car, they may have to ride in the passenger seat, and an airbag can kill a small child. If you have a um, car seat in there um yeah you can do a lot of damage with the airbags because they're they're they don't know who's there or who's not um no airbags actually do some weight sensing but we'll talk about that a little bit more but the airbag is a passive restraint that's designed to cushion the driver or passenger side if it's so equipped with during a frontal collision um it's not like a beach ball that blows up in front of you and it's like oh this is so cool and fun um what it is is actually a um a vinyl bag that opens up or nylon bags or not vinyl nylon bag that opens up in front of you here to kind of cushion this blur here and they deflate pretty quickly as well as far as the, the driver's side and the passenger side airbags now some of the curtain airbags do not deflate as quickly um the reason for that is they just want to make sure your head is safe and just away from trauma there airbag systems may be known by different names um, about every manufacturer has something else. They call it a SRS, which is a Supplemental Restraint System, Supplemental Inflatable Restraint System, SIR, and Supplemental Air Restraint, SAR. So just be aware of that. Good. <clears throat> 
And just remember, most airbags are, devo- uh, are designed to supplement the seat belts. If you do not wear your seat belt in the event of a collision there, um, you're just asking for trouble there. Seatbelts have saved many, many lives. And you'll say, well, I heard of this guy who he would have lived if his seatbelt wasn't on. Yeah, but would he, though? Are you sure? You know, seatbelts have saved a lot, a lot of lives. Excuse me, let me meet my mic. I'm about to cough. All right. We're still here. Uh, remember, most airbags are designed to supplement the safety belts in the event of a collision, and the front airbags are meant to be deployed only in the event of a frontal collision within 30 degrees of the center line of the vehicle. Um, I think we got a, a, a picture coming up about what 30 degrees of the center line of the vehicle is. Um, they're not to in, inflate during a side Im- impact. If you get hit in the side, you're driving a side airbags, they're not designed to inflate for that because that's not really going to help you because you're not moving forward in the vehicle. You're moving side to side in the vehicle. Um, so just be aware of that. Uh, the force required to deploy a typical airbag is approximately equal to the force of a vehicle hitting a wall over 10 miles per hour. Now you'll have people who are like, well, I was in a parking lot and backed up and this airbag didn't deploy or my buddy was in this car and he was in this wreck. He got hurt really bad because the airbag didn't deploy. Well, there's so many factor, there's there's basically two factors that go into airbag deployment. So just be be aware of what, what that is there. Uh, and we'll talk about that. Um, but right now we're talking about the names, some restraint systems, inflatable restraint systems, and uh, some mineral air systems there as well. Um, and the force required to trigger the sensors within the system prevents the accidental deployment if curbs are hit or brakes are applied too rapidly. Uh, the system also requires a substantial force to deploy an airbag it, to help prevent accidental inflation. All right, so let's go back to the next slide here, part two of five for airbags. Parts that are involved in airbags. You've got your sensors, the airbag inflator module, the clock spring, and the clock spring is the wire, the wire coil that's in the steering column there, so it allows the, the, the airbag to work while you're turning the steering wheel in all kind of directions there. The control module <clears throat> and the wiring and all the correct connectors there. So, you got those five different things there, your sensors, your airbag modules, uh, your clock spring, your control module, and your wiring and all your connectors there. Um, like I said, some people say that all airbag wires are yellow. I just showed you that all airbag wires are not yellow, so just be aware of that. Now, I'll switch right here. Now, to cause deployment of the airbag, two sensors must be triggered at the same time, the armoring sensor and the forward sensor. Um, sometimes the forward sensor is called a safing sensor. <coughs> Excuse me. But just be aware of this right here. You got you have two sensors that must be triggered. All right, the armoring sensor is used to provide electrical power, and a forward or discriminating sensor is used to provide a ground connection. You know, we talked about series and parallel circuits. Your airbag deployment is a series circuit. The arming sensor is where the power comes in. Okay, so it has to be triggered. The safing sensor, the forward, or the discriminating sensor is the ground side of that circuit there. So when both those switches are turned on, your airbag will deploy. If one of those switches uh, are turned on and the other one is not, your airbag will not deploy because you have a an open circuit, so to speak. And you'll see a wiring diagram here in a few moments. So just just hold that in mind um, that this is a typical series circuit here. <clears throat> the squib, not a squid, the squib with a B, uses electrical power to convert uh, and it converts it to heat for ignition of the propellant used to inflate the airbag. Um, I don't have a model rocket around me here, but when I was a kid, I had model rockets and I'm looking around because I'm in my basement and there's no telling what I've got around me here. Um, but I had this model rocket set that me and my nephew used to go and play with because he would make, he was into model rockets and so was I because boom, explosions, fire. It's awesome. Um, but the thing you put up inside of a model rocket engine to get it to actually deploy 
It's actually called a squib. It's a small piece of wire here that heats up whenever voltage goes through it. Um, it gets red hot and there basically causes the, the ignition of the rocket to begin there. And I thought it was funny that airbags use the same wor verbiage here because it's a squib that actually causes that to happen. So the squib uses the electrical power to convert the heat for ignition of the propellant used to inflate the airbag. Um, so if you have any experience with model rocketry, you know, the little squibs, you hit the button, or you got to pull the pin, hit the button, um, and hold it down. But remember, with the pin in there, I don't think it would deploy. The reason for that, it was, it was shorting it out. That way, there was no accidental deployment. Airbags have the same thing. We have some shorting sensors and shorting bars in there to kind of help prevent accidental deployment when we're starting to connect these things. Um, the squib uses electrical power and converts it into heat with the ignition of the propellant to inflate the bag. We talked about that. And before the airbag can inflate, however, the squib circuit must also have a ground supplied by the forward or the safing or the arming sensor. Must be triggered at the same time before the airbag is deployed. So you have two sensors. Let me just use one hand here. Two sensors <laughs> that are actually triggered to actually make the airbag deploy. If one is triggered, um, it won't deploy. If the other one is triggered, it won't deploy either. But they both must be um, triggered at the same time for it to be deployed. Sorry, I'm getting some messages here. <clears throat> if I seem distracted. Now, the types of airbag inflators. You have solid fuel, um, uses sodium azide pellets, and when ignited, it generates a large quantity of nitrogen gas that quickly inflates the airbag. Um, this is the first type used. It's still common used for driver and passenger side airbag inflator modules. Um, the squib is an electrically heating element. Remember that? I usually ignite the jet gas during material, uh, usually in sodium azide. And it requires about two amps of current to heat the heating element to ignite the inflator. So two amps is quite significant, but it's not a whole lot, which is when you've seen some of the stuff and how little power it takes to do some things. <clears throat> so be aware of that. Then we have compressed gas, and most of the time we're using argon. Uh, these are commonly used on passenger side airbags and roof mounted systems. Big, large airbags are seeing a lot more compressed gas. Um, the compressed gas system uses a canister filled with argon gas, um, plus a small percentage of helium at 3,000 psi. Um, a small ignite eruption is a burst disc, it releases the gas when it's synergized. The compressed gas is then, um, um, the compressed gas is actually in a long cylinder or tube that's installed inside the vehicle in the instrument panel, the seat back, the door, um, along any side rail or pillar of the vehicle, which is why if you're an emergency responder, you take the jaws of life to come in there. If you're cutting into a cylinder that has 3,000 PSI of argon and helium, Bad, it, when it ruptures, bad things happen. You know, shards of, of metal will go crazy right now. <clears throat> um, but also know that once the um, inflator is ignited, the nylon bag quickly inflates in about 30 milliseconds or 0 0.030 seconds with nitrogen gas generated by the in, inflator. And during the actual frontal collision, um, the driver's own momentum is being for, thrown forward here uh, the strong nylon bag inflates at the same time. Personal injury is reduced by spreading the load instead of breaking your nose and everything. Here. It spreads the load of that force across the whole airbag as it deflates. <gasps> Excuse me. Mm. And collapses in a collision with the, equipped with the airbag system. Uh, the bag is equipped with two large side vents that allow the bag to deflate um, immediately after inflation. And once the airbag has cushioned the occupant in the collision there. So the timeline for airbag deployment. Here's how fast it goes. The collision occurs, that second zero, 0, 0.0 milliseconds. The sensors will detect a collision, about 16 milliseconds. The airbag is deployed and the seat cover rips off that uh, steering wheel, about 40 milliseconds. The airbag is fully inflated within 100 milliseconds. So within one-tenth of a second, the airbag is fully inflated. Wow. And the airbag is fully deflated in about 250 milliseconds, so about a quarter of a second. In other words, the airbag... Deployment occurs and is over in a quarter of a second. So, if you've ever been in a vehicle, the airbag is deployed. It's like, boom! Psh, what just happened? You know, your car now is like spraying confetti and airbags everywhere. It's just kind of crazy. Um, hopefully, you weren't injured badly in that. So, just be aware of that. With this being said, there is a huge airbag recall taking place um, in the American and basically worldwide. Um, some airbags were sold that had defects in them. And the metal in the airbag as it deploys will actually be shot forward 
and I don't know if you've ever been in military or any kind of war or anything, basically that is shrapnel. And when shrapnel is, is, is deployed at a high rate <laughs> of expansion there, uh, it can pierce you, and that's what causes a lot of death. So if you have a, a vehicle that may be involved in the airbag recall, please get it checked. Um, a lot of times you can actually just enter your VIN number in, either on Google and some other things, and it'll pull up like TSBs and stuff. Um, this is this is very possible with Honda vehicles, to, uh, Toyota vehicles, GM vehicles, Ford vehicles. Um, it's just every major manufacturer, Dodge, uh, Chrysler, Jeep, every major, major, major manufacturer was affected by this uh, about a year or two ago. And millions of those vehicles still have not been um, repaired. So if you buy a used vehicle, make sure it has been repaired. Please, please, please do that. Um, let's talk about sensor operation. <clears throat> All three types of sensors act as a switch to complete the circuit. The sensor just says, hey, we've had a collision. We need to complete the circuit here. Um, you have a magnetically, oh, wow, not magically, magnetically retained gold-plated ball sensor, a rolled-up stainless steel ribbon type sensor, and an inner sensor. You have the magnetically retained gold ball, uh, the gold-plated ball sensor. Um, literally is what it says. There's a magnet here, and it has this uh, steel ball on it that's coated with gold. It's gold-plated. And as it gets this magnet here. It's in the front of the vehicle. And as the vehicle goes forward here, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. But in the event of collision, there's two wires right here, or two pieces of metal there. So in the event of that ball will get thrown forward away from that magnet and touch those two um, wires and actually complete the circuit. That's how magnetically, a magnetically retained gold-plated ball sensor works. And then after the collision happens, that gold-plated ball will probably get back up here on this magnet, and everything is good. You still have to replace those sensors just in case after a collision. <clears throat> the next thing is like a rolled-up stainless steel ribbon-type sensor. And it is literally like a party favor. It goes, and it unrolls and, and does this right here. Same thing. You have two wires right here or two pieces of metal right there on the end of it. And as the weight, the momentum of that um, stainless steel ribbon type sensor unrolls, it'll touch those two plates of metal there and actually complete that circuit. So be aware of that. Also, the force to stop the stainless steel roll rolls back into its original shape. Um, and then an integral sensor. Uh, some vehicles are using now electronic deceleration sensors built into the inflator module called an inter integral sensor. Uh, for example, GM used the term uh, Sensigand Diagnostic. There's a space missing in the book. It's a Sensigand Diagnostic Module, SDM. So that's what I have, GM. GM training, Sensigand Diagnostic Module. Um, to describe their inter integrated sensor module assembly. These units contain an accelerometer-type sensor that measures the rate of deceleration and through logic determines if an airbag should be deployed. So it uses an inter integral sensor in there. Um, that sensing and diagnostic module, that GM used that. Other manufacturers use that as well. I think we've got some uh, images coming up here of what we were talking about there earlier. Um, there are two stage airbags, have a low stage deployment and a half stage deployment, and then a low stage and half stage deployment. But what are you talking about stages of airbags? Uh, two stage airbags are often called advanced airbags or smart airbags using accelerometer type sensor to detect the force of the impact. Um, this type of sensor measures the actual amount of deceleration rate of the vehicle and is used to determine whether one or both elements of the two-stage airbag should be deployed. <clears throat> this lower force, the low-stage development, uh, deployment limit, deployment there, um, lower force is what was used to accelerate or just takes a low-speed crash. Uh, maybe you hit a pole at Walmart, back into another vehicle, you know, you're going pretty relatively low speed, above 10 miles an hour, probably less than 35 miles an hour. High stage deployment um, is used as accelerometer detects a higher speed crash and a more rapid deceleration rate. And then both a low and high stage deployment there happens. Under severe high speed crashes, stages can be deployed. So your airbags can actually be deployed at three different stages. You have your low stage deployment, your high stage deployment, and where low stage deployment can be deployed very, you know, it's not, it's good to deploy, but it may not deploy with the impact it would have to begin with. High stage deployment would be a lot more effective there at a higher speed. But on real high speeds, both stages of deployment can uh, occur 
that'll actually help slow the driver down as it's, it's moving forward there. So be aware of that. Uh, <clears throat> and here it tells you right here, it says airbag wiring is yellow for identification purposes. Yes, a lot of times the airbags themselves are, but a lot of times the pretensioners and other components aren't yellow. Even though they can deploy the same, they deploy the same way, it's a power on the ground, um, they're not always yellow. Um, that seatbelt pretension earlier, you saw it had a black cover on it. That's what you're going to see, so be aware of this. Know what you're testing before you test it. Know a connector is the connector you're testing under a seat, just in case. Um, so be aware of that. And again, with a dual-stage airbag, before we go, I'll move on, <clears throat> dual-stage airbags can contain two separate squibs or inflators, um, one for the less severe and one for the high, most severe. You don't know by looking at the, the airbag, if it's been deployed, which one was deployed. Was it the low stage or the high stage? Which means that airbag can still be live even though it's already deployed. It can still have a stage that's not deployed. Um, so just be aware of this right here. You should always always treat a deployed airbag as is live for that reason. Um, take all precautions necessary and keep any high voltage source from getting near the airbags and the inflator module terminals. Um, even static electricity can cause the airbags to deploy, so just be aware of that. But Don, you said two amps. Yeah, I know what I said, but I've seen some crazy stuff happen. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, let's give you some pictures here real quick, some images. All right. 60-5, you can see the typical airbag system showing many of the, the components. The sensing, sensing and diagnostic module it includes an arming sensor as well as electronics that keep checking the circuits for continuity and the capacitors that are just discharged to deploy the airbags. So you can see your forward sensors in the front of the vehicle there. Um, I'm going to get my pointer out here. There you go. Your, your front sensor right here is your forward sensor. And again, 30 degrees from the center line of the vehicle is not very far. It's basically headlight to headlight. Um, so if you're off center, um, it may not deploy. Um, then we go back to here to the passenger compartment sensor right here. So your forward sensor, your passenger compartment sensor. Sometimes the passenger compartment sensor is part of this SDM, the sensing and diagnostic module. Um, that's where the second sensor is. Um, on our airbag trainer, which I'll show you probably tomorrow or the day after, I'll have a video up sometime. Um, you'll see the arming sensor and the safing sensor, how they both have to be pressed for the airbag section to be deployed there. <clears throat> And then, of course, your driver inflation module is there at the steering wheel. Your passenger inflator module here is there. If you notice the passenger inflation module there, it's actually pointed up, so it'll actually ricochet off of the um, windshield. So when your airbags deploy, your windshield's broken. Your cover of your um, dash pad is broken as well, which is talk about, you know, sometimes um, airbag deployment can actually um, total the vehicle. That's why. Um, another reason it bounces off the windshield first is kind of help slow the airbag. Uh, because if that much force hits you right in the chest, it may cause more damage than otherwise. Um, and that's one of the reasons that most airbags are, you know, we do have the two-stage deployments. We do have airbags to pull off the windshield first. And those airbags are huge, the passenger side airbag. And the reason they're so huge is because the passenger has further to go before it hits the dash. Whereas the driver's side, think about how far away you are from your steering wheel. You're basically four arms length apart. Maybe even closer than that on some vehicles. So just be aware of that. The, air, the driver's side airbag is much smaller. The passenger side airbag is much larger because the volume of, of travel it has to do there. So be aware of that. All right. You're going to see right here your arming and your safety sensor. That's right. Here's a simplified airbag deployment circuit. You can note that both the arming sensor and at least one of the discriminating sensors must be activated at the same time. The arming sensor provides power, and the, either the discriminating sensors can provide ground for the circuit. Uh, you have your squib right here, right there, so you can have your power side, you can see ignition power here from your arming sensor, and again, a lot of times, um, that's, that's there, um, comes in here, one side right here, again, your SIR call, you've got a power and a ground side here, this will go to the passenger side, or discriminating sensor here, and a lot of times, that is from your sensing and diagnostic module here, then another four discriminating uh, discrimination sensor there. So be aware of that. I usually have two forward sensors on, on older vehicles. Now we've got to basically one on the center line of the vehicle there. Um, that's worked out really well. Click. 
And now the inflator module right here, you can actually take this away from the airbag housing. The squib is inside the air inflator module there and is the heating element that ignites the power technique gas generator that rapidly fills the, the nitrogen gas. Um, the airbag recall that happened, um, some manufacturer replaced the entire unit. Other manufacturers just replaced the in, in, inflator module because this right here is where the, the debris was coming from because when it, when, it, when it deployed, it would actually come through the airbag itself. So be aware of that. It just depends on which um, module you had. And I cannot remember the name of the airbag um, company that was actually recalled because it was just, just poor quality control. This is a deployed side current airbag in a training vehicle. You can see how it's got like an accordion shape to it there. The, again, that's a side curtain airbag. Because of a side collision there, <clears throat> they want to keep the glass from hitting the passengers and the driver. Um, your head, as it hits the, the, the window there, can cause problems there. And if there's another vehicle on the other side of that, you really want to be safe with that too. Just be aware of that. Side curtain airbags. And here's your magnetic sensors that we spoke of. Um, this right here is the gold-plated ball sensor. You can see the voltage from the single diagnostic module and the ground circuit of the SDM here. Um, so right here's your permanent magnet and your pull piece. Kind of helps keep it tight and strong in there. Um, and then there's your, your ball. It's got a non-magnetic sleeve around it here. That way, whenever during a collision, whenever a collision happens, this ball is able to come away from the magnetic, um, the magnet and the pull piece there. And just touch those two terminals. And they don't have to be far apart. For this to happen because you want it to happen pretty quickly here. So the direction of travel is forward here. During readiness, the contacts are open right there. And whenever impact is happening here, so hit a wall or something, you can see it stopped right here. This magnet, the magnet, wow, what a crazy word. Um, this gold plated ball here is actually pushed away from the magnet and actually contacts those two contacts there and actually completes that circuit. Then you have your ribbon sensor. We talked about that metal ribbon. Literally, it's a, it's, a, it's a metal ribbon and a roller here. You can see the stainless steel ribbon there and the roller there. And basically what happens is one side over here is battery positive on one side. And as it rolls or unrolls, it goes here and contact the other part, the contact spring right here. It's going to roll, roll in, roll up. So be aware of that. I always think of it like a party favor because that's kind of how it's, it's, it's made there. And this right here is the sensing and diagnostic module. This includes your accelerometer. Now, when we're talking about cruise control and GPS, we're talking about accelerometers and position sensors and yaw sensors. Well, guess what? Those sensors, a lot of times, are part of your sensing and diagnostic module. Um, uh, collision avoidance and things like that. So here are based off these sensors inside the sensing and diagnostic module. So we can use that information um, to actually help with, with the vehicle. Again, remember I said we try not to put so many sensors on the vehicle because if we had like four oral sensors or whatever, um, the vehicle weight and cost really increases quite a bit. So just be aware of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can reset a password. So give me a second here. Make that happen. All right. Since I can diagnose the module here, that includes an accelerometer. And again, what you'll see is going to be this metal box on the outside. You're going to see all this stuff on the inside there. But those three capacitors there stay alive for a little bit. Um, so just be aware of that. All right, let's go here. And we talk about a dual um, inflator, a dual stage airbag. Those are here's the driver's side of the dual stage. There's connections to each stage. They're not labeled um, low stage and high stage or stage one and stage two. One is for the low end force inflator and the other is for the higher force inflator. Either can be ignited or both at the same time if the acceleration sensor detects a severe impact. High speed crashes, severe impact. You're gonna have both of them detonate at the same time. And again, with airbags, treat them like they're alive no matter what. Especially if it has two of these right here. If you only have one connection here and the airbag's deployed, it's probably not gonna deploy again. It's pretty safe to say that. But if you've got an advanced um, airbag or what they call a hybrid airbag system, um, you treat it like it's live continuously. <clears throat> the airbag control module is linked to the powertrain control module. 
and the body control module on this Chrysler system. Notice the airbag wire connecting the module and the airbag to the clock spring. Both power labeled driver's airbag high and ground labeled driver's airbag low are conducted through the clock spring. So you can see right here, your powertrain control module, your body control module. This goes to your PCI bus here. There's your passenger airbag right here. And right here is the driver's airbag. And here is your clock spring. It says clock spring number two. This is on the driver's side of the vehicle there. And those clock springs allow power and ground, which is high and low, to go through this airbag circuit here. It actually um, causes the airbag to deploy. So, question. What are the two types of airbag inflators? Do you remember? Are you looking at your book? Two types of airbag inflators are solid fuel, which is your sodium azide, and compressed gas, which is your argon gas. So sodium azide, or solid fuel, and compressed gas. And again, if you didn't like really model rocketry, played with rockets when you're growing up, solid fuel is what your rockets were. Mm, all right. And remember, a lot of times you'll hear that all electrical wiring connectors and conduits for airbags are colored yellow. For airbags, yes, but that's not true for like the pretensions and other things like that. Um, and also to ensure proper connection, we talked about the, the clock spring a moment ago. Um, there's that cool assembly there. Anytime you have a steering uh, column disconnected from the steering gear or the um, rack and pinion, don't swing that steering wheel left or right. It's really fun. It'll just sit here and turn 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 and turn. And then all of a sudden you hear something go snap and then it'll just keep turning and turning and turning and turning. And then you can turn it back to center and then hook everything back up. And when you go back to it, the airbag light will be on. You'll have like an open circuit for the driver's head airbag. And you're like, well, what just happened? Well, that SIR coil can break on it. Um, in vehicles from the late 80s, early 90s, those SIR coils were good. They weren't great. And they could just randomly break at times. It's not going to deploy the airbag. It's going to call it, keep the airbag from deploying. Your airbag light will come on. Um, so just be aware of that. Let me just just this just a little bit more. There we go. So just be aware of that. Um, that clock spring prevents a lack of continuity between the sensors and the inflator assembly that might result from a horn ring type of sliding uh, conductor. Um, back in the day, we had our horn ring. We had actually a little 12-volt um, wire that came up the steering column there. And it touched the little, uh, ring that was on the back of the, the horn ring. So as the, 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 the steering wheel was turned, it would say you can actually slide on this ring here and actually give you enough connection there to honk the horn. Well, in a collision, that weighted piece of metal right there would actually come away from the horn ring and actually not deploy an airbag or cause the horn to honk. So that's why we went away from those that style setup there. And inside all of your airbag connectors, okay, and even your pretensioners, um, there's generally gold-plated terminals. If you look inside of there, there's gold-plated terminals that are used to prevent corrosion. Because um, remember, gold doesn't really corrode like silver or copper does. Um, some aluminums can corrode as well. So be aware of that. But in the, those airbag connectors are gold-plated for that reason. Um, and most airbag systems can play a diag com a contain a diagnostic unit. It's electronic. We can diagnose airbag circuits by checking for airbag codes. Um, also includes an auxiliary power supply. This way, if the battery is disconnected from the vehicle during a collision, the airbag can still deploy. So we're working on airbags, make sure you disconnect the battery like the manufacturer recommends. Disconnect that battery and wait the allotted time for those, um, those capacitors to discharge before you start taking things apart. Um, so be aware of that. So when the ignition is turned off, these capacitors are discharged. So after a few minutes, um, the airbags are still charged after you've disconnected the battery. <clears throat> now let's talk about tools. And testing. Hairbag diagnosis tools and equipment. Pause right here. I think we're going to make that video number one, and this right here will be video number two. So we'll stop this right here, and we'll go pick up right here in just a second.
All right, welcome back. Let us finish this PowerPoint up here real quick. I realize I was recording the entire time, but that's okay. We'll get through it. Hopefully, we can edit that out and, and post. Let's go right down here. Pull up a file for you now. All right, we're back. Airbag diagnosis tools and equipment. Now, every airbag system that I know of has a self test procedure. Um, the electrical portion of the airbag systems is constantly checked the circuits within the airbag energizing power unit or through the airbag controller. The electrical airbag components are monitored by applying a small voltage signal from the airbag controller through various sensors and components. And each component and sensor uses a resistor in parallel with a load or open sensor switch for use by the diagnostic signals. If continuity exists, the testing circuits measure a small voltage drop. And if an open or short occurs, a dash warning light is lighted and possible diagnostic trouble code is then stored. Follow the exact recommendations for the airbag and system being detected there. So be aware of this right here. Diagnosis and servicing of the airbag systems usually require some or all of the following items there. <clears throat> Digital multimeter. Okay. An airbag simulator or a load tool. Um, a scan tool. Now, remember, you may not know this. When I say scan tool, if I say generic scan tool, it's not going to measure airbags. It's not going to do anything like that. Um, a lot of newer scan tools are able to do more than just powertrain, but your little cheap scan tool you get from the like Wish or from Harbor Freight or something, it's just a code reader that is generally just for powertrain codes, and airbag codes are not powertrain codes because they don't affect the emissions. They're passenger safety there. Um, back in the day, you had you bought up. Um, an OBD scan tool, then you bought one for AB ABS and airbags. So you had to have two different scan tools or two different programs or two different cartridges for your scan tool that you spent or you spent a thousand dollars for. You had to have more just to test airbags and ABS systems. So yeah, but now in today's um, markets, it seems to be an all-in-one moving up. If you spend more than like a hundred or two hundred dollars on a t scan tool, it'll never come with it. So always check what code you can actually read with your scan tool. But I digress. But you're going to need a scan tool. Um, a shorting bar um, to kind of keep everything shorted out there and shorting connectors. An airbag system tester. Some manufacturers have actually airbag system testers that you want to test with. Um, specific vehicle harnesses. Um, wire repair tools. Um, such as crimp and seal weatherproof connections there. And we're going to, I'm going to have a video of some crimp and seal connections added to these, this Moodle module here. Um, most vehicle manufacturers specify the negative battery terminal must be removed when testing or working on an airbag. So be aware that a memory saver device used to keep a computer in or radio um, um, functions can supply enough electrical power to deploy airbags as well. So be aware of that. So get your radio, get your code for the radio if you don't have it already. Make sure you also get your presets of your radio. A lot of new radios, the presets will be retained, but you just got to make sure of that. Um, you don't want to go in security mode on your radio and have to call or send it to another another shop to have it opened up again. So that's some of the tools you're going to need and equipment there. But you're also going to need to take some precautions here. Always follow the, follow the recommended precautions and warning stickers. Maintain a safe working distance from all airbags. Make sure you keep a distance there. Um, if I'm working out there, I'm not going to be right up on the steering column here with my chest because if it deploys accidentally, bad things can happen. If I'm going to do anything that I think there may be an accidental airbag deployment, I'm going to probably remove that airbag and put it somewhere safe. That way, if it deploys on my workbench, I'm not worried about it deploying over there. Um, if it deploys on my chest, I'd be worried about that. So maintain a safety emphasis uh, from all airbags there. After collision, the inflator module and must be replaced. Uh, pre tensioners as well. Uh, avoid using self-powered test lights on airbag systems. So the power probe, power and ground, <laughs> boom, deploy it. We did that in one of our classes. We actually deployed an airbag with a power probe. So be aware of that. Even the little battery, once they have like a two AA batteries in it, be aware of that. Don't use power test lights on these things. Um, unless the manufacturer asks you to do that, 
don't do it. But if it says use a test light, it didn't say the word power. That just means a, 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 a bulb and two wires or a probe, a bulb, and a ground. Um, and hook it up properly or else, boom, airbag dies. Um, so what's next? Um, also, always hold the inflator away from your body. So if you have an airbag, and normally the part or the model of the vehicle is towards you, you know, when you're in the steering wheel, it's like this right here facing me. So when you pick this up, always hold this away from your, your body there. So pick it up, hold it away from me, don't look at it. Because if it deploys, bad things are going to happen. So always have the inflator module away from you. So where the airbag is going to deploy from, it's always away from you there. So always carry that away from you. Um, what else we got? <laughs> I never strike or jar a sensor. Don't hit it with a hammer. Um, don't do it. It's a bad idea. So don't strike or jar a sensor. Also, dropping an airbag or a, a, a sensor, I think we'll cover this in a minute. If you drop a sensor from about um, waist high, that simulates a 35 mile per hour crash. And most manufacturers say if your vehicle's been in a uh, crash at 35 miles an hour or higher, replace those sensors. So keep them in the box until you're ready to put them on there. Um, and if you're handling a deployed inflator, always treat it like it's alive. You just never know. Always wear gloves too. Um, some of the chemicals they put on those airbags to keep them from sticking to itself. When it deploys, it's supposed to basically turn into cornstarch. But the chemicals they use sometimes can cause irritations on your skin if you touch it. So wear, wear gloves. But I'm a proponent of wearing gloves when you work on cars anyway for several reasons. And right here you see an airbag diagnostic tester included in a plastic box. And there are also electrical connections and a load tool that substitutes the inflator module during troubleshooting. Um, that is a J37808. That is a GM Kitmore tool there. So if you're working on a General Motors vehicle, you've probably seen that tool before. I have. I've seen it many times with different modules and different connectors that we had to use for it. And basically what that was, that simulated the airbag in the, in the vehicle itself. So if we were doing testing, we could take the airbag module out, plug this into it. And basically, it would let the, the computer think the airbag was still alive in it so we could test and make sure our air clock spring was good and everything else right here. A little tip on the clock spring. If your clock spring, if you think you have an uh, open clock spring because you have an open or short on the driver's side airbag circuit, see if you have steering wheel controls. If your steering wheel controls work or your horn works, chances are you don't have a clock spring issue because most of the time the clock spring contains all like the, the cruise control on the steering wheel, the, the volume controls and the horn all goes back to the clock spring. So if you have a vehicle that has an airbag light on, the horn doesn't work, the cruise control doesn't work, none of the buttons on the, the steering column works, a lot of uh, steering wheel, not steering column, steering wheel works, a lot of times that's just a clock spring issue. So you replace the clock spring, every all the functionality will be back for that. But that, there's a special tool for your airbag so be aware of that disarming airbags disconnect the negative battery cable and remove the airbag fuse and disconnect the airbag connectors manufacturer will give you a time limit like i'll say disconnect the negative battery cable or disconnect the airbag fuse one or the other sometimes it doesn't tell you to do both and then wait three minutes five minutes ten minutes and then you can disconnect the airbag connectors there. Uh, once the airbag connector is disconnected, it's disarmed, of course. Um, you can put that airbag anywhere you want to. But until you get to that point where you feel safe enough to actually unplug that airbag and put it somewhere, be careful, beware, beware. And I'll show you kind of doing some airbag stuff here in the way we're set up here. I'll have some a vehicle or two with some airbags that we'll see here and take the airbags out of a vehicle. I'll try to film it for you so you can have it up, up so you can actually watch me do it. <clears throat> The diagnosis and service procedures. You're going to use service information to determine how the circuit is designed and the correct uh, sequence of tests to be followed. Um, again, airbags have a self-diagnostic ability there. They can detect electrical faults and disable the system and eliminate the warming lamp. Just because your warning lamp is on does not mean your airbags are disabled. Sometimes it does. It depends on what's wrong with the system there. Uh, sometimes it just lets you know that, hey, this airbag may or may be faulty. The driver's side could be fine, or the passenger side could be fine. So be aware of that. That doesn't mean they're disabled at all. Um, another thing is we're placing a steering gear, such as a wreck opinion, to make sure that no one accidentally turns the steering wheel and causes that clock spring to break. Take the keys out of the ignition column, stick them in your pocket, put them somewhere safe. Um, but now with vehicles that have push starts, that that doesn't really happen. If the vehicle's on, it's the vehicle's nearly unlocked. 
So be aware of that. Uh, driver's side airbag module replacement. <clears throat> you want to turn the steering wheel into the front wheels or position them straight ahead. That's just for everything if you're going to replace that. So the ignition off, disconnect the negative battery cable. Wait 10 minutes is what the, our book recommends is waiting 10 minutes after you disconnect the battery or battery cable. Um, about our command, 10 minutes is 10 minutes. That's that's quite a bit of time in a shop. Um, go get you a soda, drink, um, get parts for another job that you're working on. You know, talk to people. But 10 minutes, get back in there. Have another if you have another uh, job lined up, go do that. Do the oil change. Who cares? Drain some oil or something. Who knows? Loosen and remove the nuts or screws that hold the airbag module in place. Not every airbag module is held in place with air with nuts or bolts. Okay. GM uses a series of clips that you have to see here and move in a certain way. Ford has a same, has a similar method there. Fords are a pain to do. Chrysler sometimes are bolted in. Um, Honda's, Toyota's bolted in most of the time. So just be aware of that. I think I'll probably pull out um, an airbag out of the cobalt that I have and show you kind of how to do that because it's just basically a, a big heavy gauge wire that gets locked in place. Um, after you take those bolts or nuts or screws off the module, you got to pull it straight out. Uh, flip it over so you can actually disconnect the electrical connections there. And when installing the airbag module, make sure the clock spring is positioned uh, properly there. A lot of times clock springs will be on center. This is another reason. You want your steering wheel straight ahead, uh, your wheels straight. So when you pull the, the, the airbag out of it, take that steering column off to get the clock spring. It's centered. It's ready to go. So that makes it just a little easier for you as a technician. If it's like this right here, clock springs centered and the steering wheel's not, you may have to sit here and make that happen. So just be aware of that. Don't want you to have to work harder. Work smarter, not harder. So after you disconnected the bases, the yellow connector there at the base of the steering column, then the inflator module can be removed from the steering wheel and the yellow airbag connector connected to the inflator module viewed there. Now, you got a little pointer here. You can see. I'm pointing back on. Pointer. There we are. So you can see your horn buttons there, your cruise control buttons. That's all on the steering column or steering wheel itself. This is where I said if you had a clock spring issue that you thought you might have because you have an airbag light on and you have an open or short in the airbag or the, the driver's side um, airbag, is probably an SIR coil. Um, there is a test that you do. You take the airbag module off, take some other things away, um, and check the wiring at the base of the steering wheel on the top of the steering wheel here. Basically check continuity between here and the base of the steering wheel. With the airbags disconnected, so both connectors are disconnected there. Um, if you have continuity through there, then you don't have a, then you do not have a clock spring issue. You have probably an airbag module issue. So just be aware of that. Airbag electrical connector there. Sometimes it's a squeeze and pull. Sometimes it's a twist and pull. Check your service information for that. If you break that connector, that's a new clock spring you're going to have to replace. And that's just time and money. You don't disband as a technician. If it's not broke, don't fix it. Shorting bars. Here's some shorting bars. They're inside of these terminals here in most airbag connections. They're spring-loaded clips that short across both terminals of the airbag connector when it's disconnected to help prevent accidental deployment. Uh, these shorting bars right here, so you can see it's touching that one and it's touching this one right here, so it's shorted out. So that airbag should not be able to be deployed there. Um, as you can see, when this connector goes in here, it has this line here. That actually pushes this down to keep that from shorting out. So when it's connected, it's not shorted. When it's disconnected, as soon as you disconnect that terminal, it's shorted. So those, the, the power and ground side of the, the airbag terminal is just shorted. So it's a, it's a complete circuit there. So there's no way you can introduce electricity in it to actually blow the airbag unless you pull those shorting bars out or, or disable that feature there. So shorting bars are one of those things that, that are really cool. Um, in our airbag systems, um, I think I have a shorting bar terminal over here that we'll, we'll show you here in one of the videos. And that in my pick set. I have to make sure I have that with me so I can actually point it out to you. All right, ring bars. So here's what a clock spring looks like. That's the back side of it right there. Um, goes down the steering column here. A little clear one there. Nice. Got a wire out the back here that would go down the steering column on the front side. You would see that. But especially a flat conductor, you can see that flat wire right there. If we were in class, I had a, I had a clock spring I was going to take, it, take apart for you. Um, I'll probably go back to the school and grab one of those and bring it here for you guys so I can actually show you a video of kind of what it looks like. Um, basically, it's just a cool a flat wire. Um, this is here inside that little clock spring, so you can turn the steering wheel. Generally, two steering wheels turn about five 
times or six times, three in one direction, three in the other, or two and a half in one direction, two and a half in the, in the other. It just depends on how the, the steering gear is set up there. So if you want to know how many um, turns you have in your steering column, and then take your turn your vehicle on, turn the left lock, count the number of turns back to center, and then to the other side. That's how many turns you have there. Um, clock springs are used in, in a lot of different vehicles, and sometimes it's the same part number. So they have several turns left in there, but if you sit here and spin that steering wheel and it just spins and spins and spins, you're going to hear something go snap, and you might not even hear it go tink, um, but you've just, just killed that um, airbag clock spring. So be aware of that. Don't do that. And um, if you had Mustangs, again, I knew some Mustangs from the 90s. They had a problem in the 80s and 90s, the late 80s, early 90s. They had problems with their, their clock spring just breaking on them. Um, after they got 200,000 miles on them or some age on them, the clock spring, just the the – the way it was done, the room just started breaking inside of it. So it is what it is. Our materials have gotten so much better in, in today's world. Moving on. Safety when manually deploying airbags. Um, we do have to manually deploy airbags. At the dealership, if we had to send airbags back to the, to the factory or had to ship them, they were supposed to be deployed before we shipped them. Um, when possible, deploy the airbag outside of the vehicle. Yeah. Remember I told you about total in the vehicle? Bad things can happen? Yes. With the proper hearing and eye protection. I'll always say, always have your safety glasses on while you're in the shop. It helps prevent so much stuff. Um, hearing protection especially. Um, it's like a gun going off. A uh, driver's side airbag is just like a gun going off. Sometimes it's louder. A passenger side airbag is like a 12-gauge shotgun going off. It is that loud. Um, so be aware of that. Stay at least 20 feet away from the airbag, or 6 meters. Um, when we were deploying airbags, my first time there, the, the other instructor was there. They had the airbag sitting against the kind of tilted up at a 45 degree angle between the ground and the building itself. And they were going to deploy it. A student was standing about four foot in front of it looking at it, wanted to see how, how bad it was. We told him to move away from the, the airbag. He said, it's not going to hit me. I said, I don't know that. And you don't know that. Have you ever seen an airbag deploy? Yeah. Was it in a vehicle? Yeah. I said, when it's in a vehicle, it's attached to the vehicle. It's not going to come out and jump out at you. Well, when we deployed the airbag, it jumped probably about 20 feet away from the building there, and it would have just smacked him right in the face. Um, so, yeah, you want to stay about 20 feet away from the airbag, 6 meters. Um, old airbags had a lot more energy than newer airbags because they have dual stage and other things like that um, are safer for us to, to be using there. And always aware of the airbag module to cool because it did deploy. The airbag module is hot, and it stays hot for many minutes after it's deployed. <laughs> So follow the manufacturer's uh, recommendations for disposal of the airbag when it is de deployed. So be aware of that. Um, this is what a deployed airbag looks like right here. It's deployed as part of a demonstration automotive lab there. You can see the gas being expelled through the airbag itself. Um, you can see some gas right here. That's supposed to that cornstarch material that actually comes up there. <clears throat> so be aware of that. It's attached to a steering column, and it's attached to a vise. Uh, that's how we like to do it at the shop. We don't always have that option. We don't always have a whole steering column there that we can actually deploy. A lot of times we just have um, just the bag module itself, so we have to keep that kind of safe. Just like that, just like that. <clears throat> now we talk about occupant detection systems. Now, we know that we have a driver's side airbag. We always have a driver in a vehicle, almost always. So the driver's side airbag will always deploy in a collision whenever it meets the standards that hits the safing sensor and the arming sensor and the discriminating sensor that gives it thumbs up. So if you have one thumbs up from one sensor and not the other one, the airbag's not going to deploy. The airbag's not going to deploy. Both are good. Airbag's going to deploy. Think about it like that. Um, occupant detection systems. The passenger side airbag must be disabled or or deployed with reduced force in a seat that is empty or it has a child or a small adult present. People are different sizes. Just look to your left and right. Well, maybe not now. You might be at home. Um, so you got to be aware of that. Different size people take different forces there when it's when the airbag's um, de deploying there. Um, so we want to make sure it deploys with the right force for what's there. Um, so seats now have sensors in them. So when you sit down the seat, it lets the computer know that, hey, there's a passenger in that seat, and that passenger weighs X amount of pounds or kilograms. Um, <clears throat> so be aware of that. The different sensors we have is a gel-filled bladder sensor, so whenever you sit down, that gel is displaced, and it actually pushes against um, 
like a pressure sensor, um, three wire sensor, pressure sensor, whatever pressure is on that gel um, is going to be applied to there there. And the more pressure there, the heavier the person is, the, 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 the more the airbag can deploy. Uh, capacitor strip sensors, so the more the force, downward force is there, uh, the more capacitance is shown. So the the um, sensing diagnostic module, the airbag module can see that, hey, there's a heavier person, or there's a lighter person here, or there's a gallon of milk sitting there, um, and can either deploy or not deploy there. And then you have force sensing resistor sensors. What we're seeing now, a lot of our pa passengers um, or occupant detection systems there are actually sensors that actually bolt to the seat frame itself or the seat track, the seat frame. So when you sit down, it actually stresses the, the seat frame a little bit. So be aware of that. Those sensors can go bad. There was a recall on some of the Toyotas. I remember helping when I was doing some, um, helping out the Toyota dealership there, just doing some shadowing one summer. Um, the technician I was uh, shadowing there probably placed about 20 different um, seat sensors for the occupant detection system because they were uh, defective from the factory. The factory wasn't confident in their operation. So scan tool system and weights are used to check and calibrate the system there. So a lot of times what we can do is we can look at the scan tool and see the weight of the, what's in the passenger seat. <clears throat> Some manufacturers have sandbags they put in the passenger seat that after a certain weight, they would be like fully deployed be full deploy or full trigger so be aware of that so scan tool system weights are used to check and calibrate the system keep those weights clean they're going right on the passenger side of the vehicle there if this is a new vehicle with the leather seats and you set them on the ground they've got grease on them or something you set them in there you might have just ruined that interior um i know the dealership that i was playing with they were actually in a big and in drawer you had the 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 airbag occupant classification um weights in there had about three or four sandbags that just sit here and took over there to the, the vehicle and set them in the floorboard and then you set in the seat and the computer would say, okay, good. Set the next one in there. So the next one there computer would say it was good calibrated because you have to calibrate these things once you replace them. So just be aware, aware that you're going to need a scan tool and those, those calibration weights for this. And it's not within the calibration. Um, so if you're somebody's pushing a little seat back or somebody's leaning on it, or you're trying to calibrate it, it's not going to calibrate. Right. So be aware of that. You have a dash warning light on a lot of trucks and SUVs telling you that the passenger's airbag is off. If there's not enough weight in that seat, it'll turn the airbag off. Like if I have my gallon of milk or something in my, uh, my minivan I used to have, if I had like my, my backpack in there with my laptop, um, it would be off because it was not enough weight. It wasn't 30 pounds of weight there. Uh, 30 pounds is generally the, the, the amount of weight that it is to turn them on. So a car seat with a baby inside or a small child or a toddler in there, can set off an airbag, so that's why this turning that off is a great thing. <clears throat> passenger the airbag on lights if the passenger seat is detected. If passenger is in the airbag, <laughs> passenger in the airbag. Wow, uh, the tongue twister. We'll read that for script verbatim. Figure 60 dot 20. The passenger side airbag on lamp lights if the passenger is detected on the passenger seat. So if someone is sitting on the seat beside of you and you're in the driver's seat, they're in the passenger seat, the passenger's airbag light on can be displayed. So be aware of that. So here's a gel filled bladder type occupant sensor detection right there. You can see this area right through here. You can see this. Right here's the gel part right here. It's full of gel. <clears throat> and it's attached. Sorry. I don't know if I can see the sensor in this picture here. But there's a sensor. It's probably going to be on the back or probably underneath it there. That is a pressure sensor. So when you sit on this right here, pressure, even as it's um, <laughs> displaced there, that gel is displaced, so it adds pressure to the sensor here. And the pressure of the sensor, which is, is um, equal to the, the, the weight the gel displaced. So be aware that the heavier you are, the more gel will be displaced, the more pressure is on that sensor. Um, so that's how we actually tell those airbags are actually right. So here's the resistor type circuit. This right here is the sensors. Uh, the weight of the passenger strains these sensors here. So as the, the, the weight of that is on there, it strains it slightly. There it has the seat. It singles the module, the weight of the occupant. I can literally tell how much weight the person beside me is with about 5 to 10 pounds. There's a, a, a margin of error there, so be aware of that. So this is Chrysler's fake butt. Literally, it looks like somebody's rear end with, with two legs there. Um, that's this bottom plate right here. That's the first sense, first one you put on there. Then you put the second weight on there. And then you put the third weight on there. Um, 
So just be aware that's the, the test weight used to calibrate the occupant detection system on a Chrysler vehicle. So <clears throat> with that being said, that leads us to question number three. What are the three types of seat sensors? You have a gel filled bladder sensor, you have a capacitive strip sensor, and then you have a force sensing resistor sensors. And those force sensing resistor sensors that you saw on the last um, slide, that seems to be the most common way we're doing that now. Um, the gel filled, the air filled, the bladder filled, um, there's still some manufacturers that use that, but we're seeing a lot more of the resistive sensors there that I'm seeing on a lot of GMs, Toyotas, um, and I think Hondas are using the same thing. I could be wrong on that one. I don't deal with a lot of Hondas. That's what one of my students said one time. <clears throat> so gel filled, capacitor strip, and force sensing resistors. Now we're talking about side and seat curtain airbags, or seat and side curtain, not seat curtains. Seat airbags are generally mounted in the side bolster of the seat. Um, they use a variety of sensors to determine if they need to be deployed. Side airbags are mounted in one or two general locations, um, either on the seat itself, on the side of the bolster of the seat, or in the door panel. Uh, side curtain airbags can be in the headliner or in the door panel itself. A lot of times it's on that A pillar or the overhead pillar, the headliner pillar there. So be aware of that. And the deployment of both systems is dependent on the side impact sensors in their controllers. All right. Airbags. Drivers and passengers airbags. Remember, 30 degrees from the center line of the vehicle. Forward collision. Forward impact. That's the problem with those right here. A side impact is not going to be 30 degrees in the center line. It's going to be further than that. So we use different sensors for these. Okay. They use an electronic accelerometer to detect when they deploy when the airbags, and which are usually mounted in the bottom of the left and right B pillars where the front doors latch, behind the trim pedal on some of the inside vehicles there. Meet my mic, I'm about to cough. So, for that reason, a lot of times it's in the door panel itself. Sometimes it's a pressure sensor inside the door itself. If you're using a Slim Jim in there and you grab those wires and pull, Bad things can happen. So try to avoid using a Slim Jim in a vehicle equipped with side, airba uh, side airbags to help prevent damage to the components and wiring inside the system. Um, you do not want to start ripping those wires apart and causing bad things to happen. That's why we use the big easy tool, the big long pink rod or yellow rod, depending on what it is. Um, and it, it's a very effective tool to get in out of vehicles with the Slim Jims. Their days are numbered. Um, we got a Slim Jim set at the, at the college. Uh, some of you go in and out and over. It's just kind of crazy, but I've been, nah, hadn't really seen many vehicles I couldn't get into with a with a big easy tool. So just be aware of that. Um, that'll come. I don't know if I can show you a video on that though, because danger. Side current airbags. They're mounted on the headline of the door panel there. Uh, they're usually deployed by module based on the input from many different sensors, including a lateral acceleration sensor and little speed sensors. And what speeds we're going in, what pressures were happening there. <clears throat> uh, for example, um, once it's used by Ford, the ABS controller commands the brakes on one side of the vehicle to be applied using down pressure when monitoring the wheel speed sensors. If the wheels slow down with a little brake pressure, the controller assumes the vehicle could roll over, thereby deploying the side curtain airbags. Anytime it thinks there's going to be a, a rollover or a side impact collision, the side airbags can deploy. <clears throat> This means additional crash data, such as skid marks and physical evidence the crash site is needed to fully reconstruct the incident. Oh, sorry. I jumped ahead. We're talking about event data recorders there. Um, but rollover collisions, rollover protection, ROPS, rollover protection systems, they're using airbag information. They're using the same lateral and, 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 and forward um, G4 sensors, yaw sensors, um, speed sensors. So be aware of that. Here's a side uh, seat airbag right here. It deploys right in the side bolster of the seat there. Sorry, I'm getting emails. Okay, good. Good, 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 good. Um, so there's your side curtain, your side airbag right there in this passenger seat. Again, this passenger seat is ripped open now. Now we're going to replace that seat. Now you see what I say about, you know, sometimes the airbags deploy. If they all deploy, that a lot of times will be totaled for that reason.
event data recorders. So here's what I was jumping ahead because side impact, air sensors, and things like that. Parts of operation of event data recorder. These are used to record parameters just before and slightly after airbag deployments. Okay. If you're involved in a high speed collision, there's an event data recorder on your vehicle. It's like a little black box, like we talk about for airplanes and things like that. Um, the reason it's there is to kind of help instruct the scene. Um, if you were at high speeds, going at a high rate of speed, and you caused a, a collision there that killed people, they're going to pull up that event data recorder. They're going to pull that in. Now, we cannot see the, the stuff on the event data recorder as technicians. Um, that data extraction can only be done by the data crash data retrieval system. And the Highway Patrol has that. And um, NITS that. And some other, other officials will have that. But technicians, we do not have access to that information there. Um, the items that are actually recorded in the event of a, a collision there is the vehicle speed, the brakes were on or off, was the seatbelt fastened, yes or no, and the G-forces as measured by the accelerometer. And we talk about the accelerometer, um, the G-forces that are actually measured during that. So unlike an airplane data recorder, the vehicle unit is not a separate unit and does not record voice conversations. We have black boxes in airplanes, all the vocal, all the voice conversations through the headsets. They're being recorded the entire time, and every input that's done inside that cockpit. Uh, this means that additional crash data, so they're going to have to measure the skid marks. They're going to have to measure any physical evidence that's on that site is needed to help fully reconstruct that incident. The event data recorder is embedded in the airbag controller and receives data from many sources at varying sample rates. Um, the data are burned are basically in the EEPROM there, <laughs> unless the airbag deployment has been commanded on. Um, it's known as an event file. Um, again, this cannot be performed by the service technician there. You must have specific training and authorization to retrieve that data there. Uh, the airbags are deployed. Um, if the threshold G value is exceeded there, the passenger side airbag will also be deployed unless it's suppressed by either the following, either there's no passenger there or the passenger side airbag will switched off. So, um, these groups or organizations that can actually get the data out is the organ, original equipment manufacturer's representatives, so any of the manufacturers of the vehicle, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, and HTSA, the law enforcement agencies, so your local and county and federal law enforcement agencies can get that information there, and accident reconstruction companies. Sometimes an accident is so severe they want to be reconstructed or it's reconstructed for court, they have access to that event data recording file there as well. Um, it must only be retrieved by a trained crash data retrieval technician or analyst. And a technician undergoes specialized training and must pass an examination to actually be able to do this. An analyst must be able to attend training beyond that of a technician to retrieve CDR analyst certification. Um, one time we had a, a student who wanted to be a crash um, event data extraction specialist. And that's something you can get into. Um, this is just a great way to start that. Moving on to the best slide in the here, the last slide, the copyright slide. Um, just know that these slides are protected by the copyright of the manufacturer of the, the book company here. Um, this recording will be available for you online here when it gets done. And again, shoot me an email, ask me any questions you have, keep logging in, keep looking at Moodle. Um, we're going to add some more videos and stuff if they're not already there now. All right. Thanks and have a wonderful day. We'll see you later. Stop this and we'll stop recording. Again, have a great day. Have a great day.